Hey everybody, I'm Rob Childs, a Richter Swordsman out of the United States, here with another video for you. And in particular, this video is for those of you, Richter Swordsmen out there, who either are presently or have the intention of competing in a HEMA tournament somewhere, US, abroad, doesn't matter. So what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the things that I have uh, had to incorporate, a, an additional tactic, if you will, in order to allow for the maximum amount of points to be awarded when I am fencing against whoever it is. A good tournament that has got some outstanding judging, I'm telling you, is you're probably talking 75% accuracy at the absolute top. So anything less than that is kind of par for the course. So you got to go in there with that expectation. Now, everybody probably already has an understanding that rapier happens a little bit quicker than does longsword. Uh, not because necessarily that the sword is traveling so much faster, uh, although in some cases that is indeed the case, but because in longsword there is a whole lot of cutting, and cutting follows a longer path and therefore it takes a longer time. Therefore, it's more time for a judge to be able to see and process what's going on in front of them. Rapier, however, is a very thrust-centric weapon. Sure, it can cut, but primarily the rapier is designed as a thrusting weapon, and that thrust is one of the fastest attacks you're ever going to face. Now, if you've got somebody who is not an expert in rapier judging a rapier tournament, it's certainly better than having somebody who's not a swordsman at all trying to judge that, but they're not going to be able to see some of the subtleties that are involved with that thrust. And in the hands of somebody who is an expert, that thrust is going to happen sometimes so fast that if you're happening to be making your attack when the judge was blinking, I kid you not, it will be over before that blink is done and the, uh, your judge totally missed it. So I've come up with a couple of things that I do in order to help the judges to be able to see what it is that I'm doing. Now, the first thing is slowing the action down. So I know some of you are probably already saying this to yourselves right now. Well, what do you mean slowing the action down? If I do that, it's going to make it easier for my opponent to defend themselves. And yeah, you're right. It is. Uh, so this particular tactic is something that you're going to have to use your best judgment as to whether or not you can, depend, depending upon uh, the skill of your opponent. If your opponent is particularly high caliber, this is probably not the tactic that you want to employ. In which case, you're going to want to go to tactic number two. And that is when you strike your opponent, when you get that thrust and it lands, leave it there. Leave it there for another second or two. Heck, leave it in there for the entire time until the judges call a hold. Whatever the case is, whatever you feel most comfortable with. But if you do that, you are giving sufficient time for the judge to be able to see and process what just happened. I have come into firsthand experience of thrusting against my opponent, striking my opponent, my opponent stopping, myself stopping, and we're both waiting for the judges to call a hold and award some points. Not a single judge saw what I did. So we kept on going. Uh, it happens actually more often than you might think. So that being the case, I have taken to, when I strike my opponent, leaving it in them for just a little bit longer so that way the judges have time to see that yes, indeed, my opponent was struck. I know that it sounds a little counterintuitive, uh, you know, as soon as you strike your opponent, you should be working to defend yourself. Yes, under normal circumstances, that is exactly what you should be doing. In a martial context, that is absolutely what you should be doing. But we're talking about a competition here that has got no real death on the line. You've got judges that are flawed and they're going to have to, you, you got to work with them in order to be able to see everything they possibly can. Now, here's the thing. Uh, if you're working within a single rapier sword tournament, meaning you don't have anything in your offhand, uh, you're going to have to decide for yourself whether or not you're going to employ either of these tactics. Because if you slow things down, it makes it easier for your opponent to defend themselves, as I've already discussed. And if you are employing tactic number two of striking your opponent and leaving it in them, you are opening up the possibility. No, it's not even a possibility. It's going to happen that your opponent is going to hit you with an afterblow because your sword is otherwise bound up in them and you're waiting for the judges to call a hold. Yeah, I get it. I've been through it. Trust me. I strike my opponent. My opponent will then hit me with an afterblow and some points get deducted from my total score because of the fact that I got hit with an afterblow. But at the very least, I am guaranteeing that A, I come away with the most points and B, I do so because the judges are able to see what I did. Now, keep in mind, if you're fencing in a rapier and dagger tournament, this second option is a little easier to do because of the fact that you have a second weapon to defend yourself with. I have found this to be the case myself. But keep in mind, leaving your sword in that person 
even locking them out with your dagger, it still opens up a possibility that your opponent can get uh, another shot at that after blow. Um, again, judges are doing their best, and I have nothing but respect for people that are trying to keep up with the action in a rapier tournament, but uh, if I stick around leaving my sword in my opponent, it's going to indeed uh, open up the opportunity for my opponent to hit me, even though the judges can see that it was a second intention or even third intention, which the after blow should be null and void at that point, but hey, we're gonna take everything into account. So if you have any questions on this, by all means, please feel free and reach out to me. I have uh, more than enough patience to handle all kinds of questions when it comes to this, and I know some of you are gonna agree, some of you are gonna disagree, that's perfectly fine. I'm just sharing this as a bit of advice for those of you out there, so that way you might be able to save yourself a little bit of frustration in the future. Again, any questions, reach out to me on the YouTube channel. You can reach out to me on Facebook. I am more than happy to help where I can. But in the interim, I hope you guys are all keeping your practice up, staying safe, and looking forward to seeing you at a tournament sometime soon.